Hey guys, it's been a, a hot minute or two since I posted. Um, so on this one, I had someone send me a clip of a preacher in North Carolina. I never heard of him before. Um, the person sent me just a clip. I didn't know until later on when I listened to the whole service and recorded it. That you know how YouTube will show you other recommended videos down the side. There was one, it looked like MSNBC was covering something viral, he said. So I listened to that, which I'm going to share here with you right now. And I thought, interesting, this is about the service that I'm listening to right now. So I stopped the recording and I recorded this and um, pretty much it speaks for itself. I juxtaposed it with Mike and the service that I covered when I talked about the book that he would not give the name of. And when he spent basically three quarters of a service, I'll be, I'll be conservative and say two thirds of a service talking about communism, giving quotes from the book about communism. And it struck me that what what are people getting from this? What is this place turning into under the leadership of Mike Keckel? And so I'm going to play the clip from MSNBC, which I never thought I would, because pretty much uh, do not agree with their coverage of things and their viewpoints, but here I kind of do. Now, nothing's 100%, okay? But it all ties in, and some things that Preacher says tie in nicely to show exactly what I was thinking when I heard Keckle's service. Again, let me remind you, I'm not here to build up a sort of faith or religion or anything or theology. I'm not here to dismantle. It all has to do with taking NTCC. What do they say they believe? They say they believe the King James Version of the Bible. Let's see how do they treat it and how do they use it to keep people coerced to stay. I'm going to play this. I don't know that I've put but a couple of little comments in between. And I would be really interested to hear what you think about it. Have a good night. Pretty incredible video we want to show you. It's an evangelical pastor delivering a forceful sermon, denouncing what's become known as the Trump Bible as blasphemous and disgusting. So in March, Trump, as you know, began selling a $60 God Bless the USA Bible complete with copies of the nation's founding documents. The April 14th sermon by Reverend Lauren Livingston, senior pastor of Central Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, has gone viral, drawing millions of views so far. Take a when look. When you don't read and pray... You, you say, wow, there's a Bible out now that includes the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Isn't that wonderful? No. No, it's disgusting. It's blasphemous. It's a ploy. Are you kidding me? Some of you are so encouraged by that. Let me tell you something. The gospel is not an American gospel. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But pastor, I bought the Bible. Really? You're telling me that you're encouraged because someone took a government U.S. Constitution, a document that says we are of the people, by the people, and for the people, the people, the people, the people. 
and you have put it right beside the Word of God, which is eternal, unchanging, which says, of Him, by Him, through Him, to Him, from Him are all things, and you're going to put those together and be happy about it? God forbid. Now, you can get mad if you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. If you glory in that kind of thing, you don't have a prayer life. If you glory in that kind of mess, political mess, you do not know what the Word of God says. Since I don't know really anything about the Trump Bible, as they're calling it, um, I can only imagine what the marketing idea is behind it all especially if someone needs money. But um, that's aside from everything else here. Let's bring in right now Russell Moore. He's the editor-in-chief at Christianity Today and leads its public theology project. We also have still with us David French. And, and you know, Russell, uh, before anybody gets confused, this gentleman is not going to be a Democratic delegate to the Chicago nope. uh, Democratic Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, he, his positions on abortion, on LBGTQ mm -hmm. issues, on many other issues, uh, would not come close to fitting uh, what the Democratic Party's message would be on those issues or beliefs. That said, that actually makes that a more stinging indictment among Republican evangelicals, I think, what he just said. Ta take us through what he just said and how, how it aligns with so much of what um, you believe and David and I believe. Well, what he said shouldn't be uh, con controversial or even remarkable at all. It was an old-fashioned uh, sermon against idolatry. Uh, it's the fact that we're living in such strange times that we even take uh, take notice of this. What I notice about this man is he's not scared. Uh, I don't know him. I've, I've never heard him before. But there are so many people who are scared of their audiences that they're mm -hmm. afraid of what's going to happen. And I guarantee you that this guy was being stopped in the foyer or on the way out of the church to say, how dare you criticize uh, Donald Trump? But he's he's recognizing that what's happening here is the politicizing of religion in a way that's not just destroying our politics, but also destroying our our religion. Oh, e even the golden calf didn't charge admission. And we have now people who are selling products to us uh, with our own sacred texts, mixing them together in some sort of a, a political marketing campaign that that is doing something really sick uh, to all of us. And, you know, I think this pastor recognizes Donald Trump has a lot of branded properties with his name on them. Church of Jesus Christ shouldn't be one of them. Russell, part of what's so extraordinary about that clip that's gone viral is that it is, in fact, extraordinary, meaning that we don't see more of it. It seems like kind of an obvious point. So what is what is your sense of why that is? Is it a fear of the congregation in the same way that politicians fear Trump voters? Well, you have politicians who fear their audiences across the board. And some, in some ways, it's the same impulse we see on these university campuses with faculty members who are afraid to, to say to campus uh, demonstrators, you can't be screaming anti-Semitic remarks because they don't want to lose their, uh, their, their base. Same thing happens, sadly, in churches. And there are some people who don't want to get the kind of angry emails, uh, that, and conversations that come if they criticize a, a favored candidate in their churches. Some other people simply think if we just ride this out long enough, it, it will go away. Well, we're eight years in, it's not going away. And if we look at what's the result, we have uh, church attendance uh, plummeting. We have people who are willing to call themselves evangelicals plummeting. And what's one of the reasons for that? People see it as just another form of politics. We have to have people who are willing to say, no, the gospel is actually more than that. You know, um, David French, I wonder if you're you're sensing what I'm sensing. I, again, I think maybe I'm always a little too optimistic, but I'm hearing pastors preach sermons this year in churches that four years ago were all in. They may not say vote for Donald Trump, but mm -hmm. they were all in. I'm hearing this message more from pastors in very conservative churches saying, you know what? 
let's do this. Let's keep politics outside the church doors and let's just let in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's focus on that for a while, people. What a radical concept. I'm picking that up in, in some conservative places. I'm, I'm going to church. I'm wondering if you are as well. A little bit, Joe. I'm going to be a little less optimistic <laughs> than you, little, to be yeah. honest. Just yeah. a little bit. It's a what I'm, sen- yeah. Yeah, what, what I'm sensing more of is the people who are tired of the Trump phenomenon are just dropping out. The, the, the exhaustion factor more than the pushback, which... I was so happy to see that clip. It was so powerfully stated, so eloquently and directly stated. But one of the reasons why it went so viral is because it is such the exception rather than the rule. And what I'm seeing happen all around me in my very, very GOP part of the country where I live is the people who are tired of Trump and all of this. They're much more apt to check out than to actually rise up in opposition to it. They'll they'll retreat kind of back into the bushes rather than actively oppose it. And it's just like Russell said, there's this sense of, well, hopefully this will pass. This is going to be over. At some point, this will be over. And that's what I'm seeing. That, But this clip, you never know what will prick another heart to say enough is enough or another group of people to say enough is enough. So every one of these clips where someone has the guts to stand up and say obviously true things so well, those things help. But as far as yeah. the mass, when people are upset with Trump, they're checking out, not opposing him as much, at least where I am. Yeah. And 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 and, and finally, Russell, uh, I've, I've got to say that. Unfortunately, and you've talked about this a good bit, pastors, too many pastors over the past seven years have been scared to tell their congregations the truth. And they've told you that quietly. I've had pastors quietly telling me that, hey, I've got to ride this wave and figure out how to get through to the other side. Um, and meanwhile, the, just the hatred and the venom inside of these churches is, is, is shocking. And Tim Alberta told his story of being at his dad's funeral and the receiving line coming in and people attacking him for, for, for reporting uh, on Donald Trump. You know, I I told the story before about uh, being at my mom's funeral, shaking hands and uh, hands with people that I went to church with four times a week at First Baptist Church uh, in in Pensacola, coming up to me, saying that they're praying for me and God, God is not pleased because I'm not not supporting Donald Trump. And, you know, my mom's casket right there two feet behind me. And what do you say other than what I said to her, which is, I want you to know, I will be praying for you tonight you and praying that Jesus Christ will find his way back into your heart because he's not there right <laughs> now. It's just, it's shocking how, this is straight out of Jeremiah. This is straight out of Jeremiah and the worshiping of idols. So, and, and again, this is not about, do you vote for Donald Trump? Do you vote for Joe Biden? This is about what goes on inside yeah. of the church. Is it, a, is it an arm of a political party or is it the altar of Jesus Christ? It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty simple, but when a politician becomes the religion, then who's in and who's out is defined by how enthusiastically they support the politician. That's what's so tragic about what's happening right here. There have been a lot of pastors who have been profiles in courage uh, when it comes to this, saying we're not going to hand our, our Bibles or our pulpits over to a political movement. But a lot of those pastors aren't in ministry anymore. Uh, precisely because of the kind of uh, backlash that they have. And as David said, uh, a lot of people who aren't on board with this are just checking out and they're just leaving. And that means people really have to have to stand up and say, we, we have something we have to hand on to our children and the generations to come. And it can't be just another mess of political pottage. This next part, um, I've already posted a video with these clips and... It was the one about the book that that Mike wouldn't name. So as you listen to this service, keep in mind what Mike said at the beginning of the service, 
which was this. To see people in the house of the Lord that do not know Christ, that I may witness to you. I want to preach to you today about the testimony of the dead. But here's a quote that comes from, and I, I don't desire to get political today, but it does apply to the message. You might not think so at first, but it will. It's a quote that comes from an important publication from the Epoch Times, E-P-O-C-H, not E-P-I-C. The Epoch Times, one of the rare truth-telling news groups of today. A book that all our Bible school students are now reading and doing a book report on. But I want them to read this book because it explains, I think everyone should read it, if they want to see the truth of what everything's about without all the propaganda and the trash, you want to really know what's going on and really unlock history. Let's remember and let's remind you what Mike said at the beginning of service. He has people there who this is a preacher's dream, right? He wants to shine the light for them of Jesus. That I may witness to you and learn about your country, America, you should read that book. If you want to know what it is, talk to me. The name of the book is How the Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World. And uh, it, you should care about it. I don't care how old you are. If you're a teenager, you ought to want to read it because it will open up and you'll be able to see what your teachers are trying to do to you at the school. And it will unlock your understanding. And further, whether you do or do not read it, it significantly impacts your life. So you ought to be able to see what is real so you can protect yourself. Protect yourself? Protect yourself? Now, it is a book about something called communism, which is a political system. You may say, well, it doesn't matter what political system we have. As long as it gives me what I need and I don't have to work for it, or I'm willing to work as long as I can work and make a living, it doesn't matter. I don't care what our government is doing, or what kind of government we have, but uh, what people don't know and what's not shown to you is the phases of getting rid of one and instituting the other. And the final phase is, according to their own documents, to just take by force and wipe out anybody that opposes you, which is kind of what almost happened in Canada. Right under our noses. And so this system has main goals. One main and critical goal of theirs is to eliminate religion. I'm not going to go any further with the comparison. I think you get the point. And I found the service that the news report was from, and so here's a little bit more of that. You're supposed to love everybody the way you want to be loved. You're supposed to treat people with respect, but you can never stay angry. Never. But there are plenty of people who are angry and pastors in pulpits, and that's all they preach about because they are angry. And they are feeding confusion to the congregation. They're not preaching the word of God. What he says here applies to Mike 100%. And not just Mike. A lot of preachers in NTCC. I sometimes think they're so angry because they're stuck there. They're preaching their own feelings and angers about things. If you don't read and pray, you'll think it's a good thing that there's a Bible now that has the Constitution on one side and the Bill of Rights on the other. Some of you think that's good? That somebody... Produced a Bible, the Holy Word of God, and decided to Americanize it by putting the Constitution in it and the Bill of Rights and other government documents. Are you telling me 
that you would take a document that says this is of the people, by the people, for the people, and stick it up beside the holy word of God that is infallible, eternal, and it's not about me, but it's about him. Are you going to tell me that it's okay to stick the, a bill of rights, our rights, American, just Americans, in God's holy word? And turn this whole thing into an American Bible with an American gospel? Oh, some of you are really upset with me right now. I'm not sharing this. Remember, please remember. I'm not saying, I found this great guy and you need to hear him. No, this is a juxtaposition between him and Mike. Also, who went viral? This guy went viral because... He's saying something that maybe a lot of preachers won't say or are afraid to say. I don't know. I, I'm sure for every person who sees this and puts the two of them side by side, just portions of each of their services, of course, you know, you're going to come away with something different and you have to decide for yourself what is the significance of it. Uh, if I go to NTCC and I think they are this great move of God, which they've been telling, they've been telling their students and telling their church members that's what they are since their inception. Like God had to raise them up because he needed, he needed the truth to be out there. Because it wasn't being preached. That's what Keckle said in that um, video that I shared. I believe it was a short about NTCC being the last hope for America. And I just said that before. But it's worth repeating. So this is about analyzing and looking at what are you involved in or what are you about to step into. Especially when you hear the part where this guy talks about the busyness. Because honestly, if New Testament Christian Churches of America Incorporated are America's last hope for um, salvation, for knowledge of God, then America is up a creek without a paddle. They're going upstream in a leaky boat without paddles. But I'm here to tell you that is a cheap ploy. And if you can't see the difference, if, if the Word of God, the piercing Word of God, has not been able to divide your spirit from your soul, you will think that this is okay and it's going to bring a revival to America. You know why we're such casual Christians? Do you know why we don't believe that we have all authority over the, the enemy? And want me to tell you why we don't rejoice constantly about our names being written in heaven? It's because we feed the flesh. How many weeks ago was it that I said, the reason we can't enjoy a feast at the table of the Lord is because we've been nibbling at the table of the world all week long. We feed the flesh. Romans strictly says, The day is far spent, the night is at hand, time is running out. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it. Since time is short, put on Jesus. That's all you need. Don't make provisions for the flesh. You can't be casual, brothers and sisters. We must be determined, aggressive warriors in the spirit world. We've got to deny the flesh and the world and the devil. We've got to remove everything from our lives that keeps us falling all the time. And I've just developed a theory. I have, I have developed this theory about sinning Christians. It tells me if you're constantly in sin, 
and you come up here every weekend and try it again, you are not reading your Bible. You are not eating the Word of God. You're having devotions. David said, your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I am of a growing concern. That's not the right word. Conviction. I am of a growing conviction that if I will pray the way the Bible tells me to pray and I will eat the Word of God the way I'm instructed to eat the Word of God, sin will not have the hold on me. It does not have the appeal to me that it had. But once you start feeding the flesh, the flesh just gobbles it up. (laughs) There's another thing. I use this verse so many times. No man who is to be a soldier will entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may Be loyal to the one who called him to be a soldier. Did you hear that? Entangled with the affairs of this life. So the world is adept at showing you things on the news that upset you. That bring stuff to the surface. That create division and animosity. That's their job. It's the devil's job. They're doing the devil's job. They can't tell the truth because they are not of the truth. And when you watch it and you say, my, 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 look at that. I didn't know that. Well, you haven't heard the whole truth. And it keeps you confused and stirred up. And in inflamed flesh or a stirred spirit. Do you remember this? When Paul went into Athens and saw all of these gods, it says his spirit was stirred within him. He was jealous for God. But what drives a lot of people is inflamed flesh. They see things about them and this world and the temporariness of this world. And instead of being stirred in their spirit about spiritual things, about the integrity and holiness of God, they get stirred up about what's being done to them and what's happening in politics and in all of this other stuff. Brothers and sisters, that's called being entangled with the affairs of this life. You cannot bear fruit. You cannot rejoice that your name is written in heaven. You cannot recognize that you have all authority over the power of the enemy as long as you are feeding your flesh With that stuff, it will keep you down, it will keep you upset, and keep you mad at somebody somewhere all the time. We feed our flesh. Whatever you feed thrives. The the Spirit of God doesn't thrive just because you say, I'm saved. The Spirit of God must be fed. It must be nurtured. It must be cherished. It is precious, and the only way to do that is through Scripture. But we feed the flesh. The flesh needs anger. In fact, I, this is what I preached. This next clip that goes along with all this ties in very well with the whole busyness of servicemen's homes and all of the churches in this organization and how cults operate. They have to keep you busy and tired and not thinking. And I've said this before. Now, I, I don't know this guy. I I saw something, as I said earlier, that somebody shared with me. I did my own little bit of research. I listened to his one whole sermon. And in comparing these two churches, NTCC and this guy's, They both seemingly believe similar, mostly similar things. I'm sure NTCC people will look in the audience here and already say, oh, forget them. They don't have outward holiness. And even in this guy's message from April 14th, 2024, he gets on preachers and pulpits who are casual 
and don't wear a tie. So they both have similar, they're judging people by an outward thing, which has nothing, it it's, doesn't say anything. If, again, we're judging them by the Bible, they say they believe. Don't know where the whole suit and tie thing comes in. But I would say go listen to the whole service and see what you come away with. It's about it's about believing that NTCC, and they have said it. Go look in my videos. He thinks they're the last hope for America. Not even the world for America. And these things should make you stop and think, what am I involved in? Why are we turning to such a political message? The flesh needs activity. Got to do something. The flesh needs busyness. The flesh needs noise. It grows, it prospers, it flourishes in noisy crowds. And it flourishes when there's an absence of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit of God thrives in stillness. Shh. Be still and know that I am God. The Spirit of God begins to rise up in stillness, in silence. Silence. What's wrong with us? Even us Christians, we got to have music banging in our heads all day long. Earbuds and earphones and in the car, bang, 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 bass and singing and screaming and howling. Even if it's Christian, we can't live without it. We can't turn it off. We cannot be in silence. We're afraid of ourselves. We fear silence. The Spirit thrives in solitude, being alone. We don't want to be alone either. I, I, I need somebody. I need to talk. No. Jesus often went away to be in solitude. Before God ever put a word in a prophet's mouth, He took him to a lonely place of solitude and let him stay there till he had no fight left within him, till he didn't even want Anything else. The Spirit thrives on Scripture. And folks, you got to hear this preacher today. You cannot grow spiritually coming to church and enjoying the music and clapping your hands and going on missions programs or trips. You cannot grow because the people are excited. You can only grow when you eat the Word of God. Thy words were found, Jeremiah said. Hey, I'm not telling you anything new. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And they became the joy and rejoicing of my soul, because I am called by your name. Did you hear that? Thy words were found. He was searching. He was looking. Digging. Your words were found and I ate them. I got them inside of me. I acted them out. And then the joy and the rejoicing became mine to enjoy. The word of the living God. Thanks so much for listening. I know these were a little bit longer clips. And I did... I chose the ones I did for a reason. The juxtaposition of the two of them. The fact that the people on MSNBC of all places. Now, obviously, very likely, their motivation is to cast aspersions on Trump. Of course, that's what their MO is over there. But you have to push that aside and realize that I thought it was interesting that they put as long of a clip as they did of this guy and that they were, I mean, 
if somebody's a Christian and they believe the Bible, then here is MSNBC pretty much promoting that. And you have somebody like NTCC who claims to be the last hope for America, not even for the world. And they are preaching communism, anti-communism, and books about anti-communism, and newsletters, and, and publications that are of a certain ilk. Keckel claimed to care that he had people there that hadn't heard the gospel, and yet he didn't present that to them. You have to ask, what am I involved in? What is this becoming? It's already a mess. Anyway, hopefully it's something to think about and to ponder. Just what you're allowing yourself. I I think what that one guy said, the one... The bald guy in the in the news report, I believe he was a New York Times columnist, if I'm not mistaken, was he said that Trump supporters tend to just go in the background if they are losing interest and they're just exhausted from it. And they don't fight it and they don't speak up. And I think that is a perfect way to describe people who hang around NTCC and never leave. They're exhausted from it, literally exhausted, literally exhausted in their body and in their minds and in their souls, emotionally drained, especially when they are estranged from family and friends for many years, maybe even decades. And they just go into the background, into the shadows. Maybe they move towards the back of the church. They're they're very likely like a lot of us who left. They weren't maybe sitting there thinking about thinking about stuff, but they're disturbed. There's a disturbance within them. There's a a pulling back. And maybe they don't even know that they can They can fight it by leaving. If they speak up, if they question, they know what's going to happen, so they don't do that. We all know. We all knew. And so I just hope you'll search out what he was talking about. I would like you to search out the truth. Really get the time alone. When he talked about that, I was like, yes, that is so important because that is not afforded to you. If you say, you know what, I'm going to stay home this Sunday night. I'm not going to service. I'm just going to stay home and chill and be, find some quietness. What the whole plan of God in your life will be uprooted. If you don't go, that's a problem. I don't think so, but they will tell you that. No, you don't have to go on a Saturday, but why wouldn't you want to? And forget if you're in a serviceman's home, because you have to do it. You have to. You don't have a choice. You cannot rest when you want to. You're an adult human being. If you believe the Bible, if you say, I believe the Bible, then where is it in there that you don't have a free will to rest when you want. Of course, if you sign something and if you hand over money to these people to live in their home and their commune, then you don't have a choice. But then why stay? Why stay in the home? Why stay in the church? And people from the very top down should be asking themselves that. Clearly, Mike's heart is not in 
the word of God that he professes to love and care about and uphold because that's not where his passion or enthusiasm is. It's in the political realm. It's in what's going on in the world realm. And you see it. You sit there in church. You see it. You hear it. But you don't know what to do about it. And to make the move to leave is a big one. Because you do already know, as we all did, you will lose your friends. You look around. Look around right now and say, no, she's my bestie. I don't use that word, but some people do. That would never happen. Guess what? It will happen. It will happen. It, you have to make that choice. Do I stay in this unhealthy environment or do I leave and make new friends and hope the ones I have in this group will eventually leave as well and we can reconnect as many of us have. I'll leave you with that. This is getting long. I hope you have an amazing rest of your weekend. And we'll be working on another one in the morning. Well, later in the morning, it's already morning.